Accidents can occur in any workshop, be it due to carelessness, fault handling or just bad luck. Of course you should do your best to avoid such a thing. An important step to minimize injuries and accidents is personal protective equipment. But even with this, accidents and injuries can still occur. In this case, first aid is important. In most cases this is hopefully only a plaster on a small cut, at worst a life-saving pressure bandage. I don't want to go into details any further here, I just want to make clear that a first aid cabinet is a useful thing and belongs in every workshop just like the first aid box in the car. Since I don't have any in my workshop yet, I decided to build one. I thought of a simple box with a big door with a red cross on it. I wasn't sure whether I should make a red or a green cross. For first aid the cross is usually green, but the famous red cross I thought looks better in the end. The box should have two insert bottoms, but different sized compartments. After a brief brainstorming where such a first aid cabinet would be placed best, I've decided for the space between the two entrance gates. Here it's always visible and in reach without being in the way. Here I have about 40 cm in width and 60 cm in height. 50 cm depth are also sufficient. The frame should be mitered and glued with doubles. The cross should be milled through the door and then be closed with a painted veneer plate on the back. I think this will look a lot better than a painted or printed cross, and painting will also be easier this way. Besides, I didn't want to buy any new materials, so the cabinet had to be made of residual wood. The wood still had holes and beveled edges from earlier projects, which I had to cut away. At the table saw, the two side walls are created quickly. For the frame I had to make some miter cuts, therefore the saw blade must be tilted to 45 degrees or 135 depending on your point of measurement. For the top and bottom I first cut a white board to mire and then divided it. So the top and bottom are guaranteed to have the same length and the same mitre angle. I didn't do that to the side parts which should take revenge immediately. But first of all everything should be planed. Because I only cut the sides to mitre after cutting them to length they didn't have the exact same length. Therefore I had to recut and shorten them on the miter saw. With the rear panel I was faced with the choice of mitering it, but this would have required a high degree of precision and probably would not have fitted. So I wanted to let them in with a rabbit instead. The rabbit had to be milled into the other parts. You can't take away the entire depth at once with the router, so you have to make several miling passes cutting deeper and deeper into the wood until you reach the desired depth. That's why I drive several times over the rabbit here. The two inset bottoms should sit in a groove, which I miled directly afterwards. The 
miters should be reinforced with lamellos. To do this I use a lamello miling machine to cut slots in the crosscut wood into which the dowels are inserted. You can connect the pieces of timber well with these flat dowels without having them slip. I only use remnants here, so there were still some old dowels left in the wood. It's difficult to push it through the circular saw with these dowels, so I had to cut them. But I had no suitable saw for this task, aside from this old frame saw still left over from my grandpa. It was already very dull and rusty, but I still got the job done. This piece will become the rear panel. Now the insert bottoms are still missing. They should be relatively thin, so they must be planed often. Here you can see what happens when you try to do the work of a thickness planer on a surface planer. The board becomes wedge shaped, but the thickness planer will straighten it out. For the door I first had to put the box together and measure it. By cutting the side parts to length at the beginning the dimensions have shifted somewhat. This piece offered just enough space to cut the door out of it. But the plate was not flat. It was also way too big for my jointer, so I had to use my hand planer. I then drew the cross with a pencil, drilled out the corners and cut it out with a jigsaw. I tried to cut along the lines I drew but didn't cross it. You can still cut away wood but to add wood again would be difficult. Afterwards I straightened the wood with a chisel and the file. I rounded off the resulting edge with a router. I didn't want to have a sharp angular edge there, but a big round over.
this veneer plate should serve only as a paint carrier. The cross should be, as I already said, red. Therefore, I first cut it roughly to the size of the door and then marked where the cross sits. Then I generously painted this area. I applied two coats of lacquer and left it to dry overnight. The next day I sanded the varnish a little bit, then I could glue the door to the veneer. Once again I used too much glue and it swelled into the cross. With the color you can scrape off such remains quite well. I deliberately kept the veneer plate larger than the door. I wanted to trim it to the right size with the router after gluing. There are special miling heads for this which are equipped with a ball bearing, preventing miling into the material below. Now I was ready for the finish. I use clear lacquer which I brush on. I've made here again two coats with sanding in between. After it dried I could glue everything. The lamellos fixated the miters and ensured that nothing slips off. These corner clamps add additional hold. You can never have enough clamps. Ever. The cabinet is later hung on its rear plate, so it carries the whole weight. That's why I didn't use a thin veneer plate or something like that, but a rather thick, solid wooden plate. It's difficult for me to put lamellos in here and I don't want to rely on just the glue, so I nailed the rear plate additionally. Maybe I overdid it. A little bit. I knew that I had some cup hinges lying around somewhere in my workshop. I wanted to use them for the door. I drill a 35mm recess hole into the door, into which the name giving cup fits perfectly.
Each hinge has a base plate where the hinge is clipped in. The base plate is screwed into the cabinet separately and the door can then simply be hooked in. With the cup hinge you can also make fine adjustments so nothing squeaks and the door shuts just fine. The cabinet itself is now finished, it just has to be hung up. First I had to make room for it, in the wall there were some old nails and screws left. From my French cleat system I still had a strip left which should be used here now. With the French cleat I can put the cabinet in front of the cable running here so I don't have to move it and stay flexible. can change the cabinet's position at any time and put it somewhere on my French cleat if I want to. Or hang something else between the garage doors. 